There you go. I was wondering when you were going to come around again. <laughs> I'm not just I'm not just saying he's a good man because he's on the Zoom link with me. <laughs> he's a he's definitely a good man and he does a great interview. Arrow, you'll have till just before top of the hour, my and, friend. And I send checks to Michael every week. I mean, I, I no, can't be don't. late. <laughs> no, you don't. If you did, I'd have season tickets to the Mets game. <laughs> How are you doing today, dude? Good, good to see you on here, Arrow. I like your name, man. That's awesome. Well, you know, it's one of those things. I it was my my first wife was was a writer, and I hope she still is. But the it, we were trying to come up with a character that was uh, the head of a, a nightclub, and we thought, okay, a name like Arrow says, I not only run this club, I own this club, and I thought I want that kind of a personality in radio. So when I returned to Billings, Montana, I went. I didn't go out there as my real name. I went out there as Arrow. Now I have to fill his shoes, and every day I have to fill that dude. And you've got to be. Be the same way dude because when you step out there to perform are they really your shoes or the performer's shoes uh, yeah i that's a good question i you know i i think as a kid i was trying to fill shoes and mm -hmm. now you know i'm 36 year old man i've been in nashville for almost a decade now i've been you know an artist full-time for seven years touring for four pretty heavily so now it's just like i i've learned the more authentic you are and the more real you are, the more chest wide open, show your heart to everyone. That's where you really connect with people. And that's what I feel like, you know, we've accomplished, you know, I'll, I'll tell the story quickly, but I lost my mom to Alzheimer's oh, a couple years back when she was really, really sick. I wrote a song about it called blank stairs yep. and actually brought her on stage uh, during a performance. I was come, going through my home state of Iowa and uh, we decided to bring her on stage. I think people hear about the disease Alzheimer's, especially young people, and they associate it with elderly, um, which is a myth. My mother was only 51 years old. Mm. Um, so we, mm. they, people got to see it with their own eyes. I think a lot of people for the first time to see this, you, you know, younger to middle-aged lady look looking like she's 80 years old and um, very, very sick. And so I told our story and I sang this song and a guy in the crowd took a video of it. He put it on his personal Facebook page. It turned into several viral videos that got 500 million views. I'm proud to say even after she passed in 2019, I've stayed on the road. I've teamed up with the National Alzheimer's Association and uh, we've raised about 50 million bucks to fight against Alzheimer's. So Dude, I, I, I got to tell you, there's a reason why we're talking today. And and, and the I, I, I have the John Lennon uh, uh, Mont Blanc uh, writing instrument. And the reason why is because all the proceeds went to Alzheimer's. And so I wrote a book called uh, Scrambled Eggs that's written about John Lennon. And, and I didn't say that he that he was gone. I, I wrote a story about him having Alzheimer's and how creative people are that have Alzheimer's. Well, it connected me to Glenn Campbell and his family. It, it, mm. it is something that really brings people together because... It's so misunderstood, and yet it's all right there in front of us. That's right. Yeah, it, it, it really is. I think it's the sixth leading cause of death in, in the United States. I don't think a lot of people know that, you know. So, you know, I never talk about politics, but it's a little frustrating during COVID, you know, to see all these COVID numbers, but to know that, you know, the numbers be behind Alzheimer's are much, much greater, yep. you know, especially how closely tied that we are to it. It's a personal thing for me, so... You know, I, I went to war against this disease, and that was a big part of me going on the show was hoping that I could put more eyes and ears on what we've already done. And so I could not be more proud and more thankful for The Voice for highlighting that story in mm -hmm. such a beautiful way. Really emotional to watch. And then, you know, the next day after the Blind Audition, the song went number two on the country iTunes chart. Wow. So I never thought I'd see that, a song that I wrote out of, you know, a painful place to really help a lot of people and bring healing. So, which I've learned... You know, you talk about, about, you know, being a performer for me and filling shoes. Like, it's it's really not about that. It's about, like, I feel like I have an obligation yep. to talk about this, you know. So I'm the tatted up guy that's, you know, put on a fun show. But at the end of every show, I'm yeah. always going to tell the story. I'm always going to sing this song. Now, not uh, the one of the things, Alzheimer's had a positive in my life. And the positive is, is that for every day of my life, I begged my mother to stop smoking. When she, when she mm -hmm. was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, she forgot to start smoke and 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 all of a sudden she stopped and it was like that's the positive so and, and that's what i lean on in in, the, in in losing her is that she stopped smoking before she passed wow, wow. that's cool man I, I love the positive stories i was you know i do a benefit almost every weekend and we always try to talk about 
the positive things, you know, just like the good moments, the good stories. And that's a good one, man. Thank you for sharing. Being in Nashville, you know, those of us on this side of the speaker, we think that you guys are just sitting around the room, just writing out tunes and stuff like that. We don't see the the, the grunt and the grind that goes into it. You, you're all about shaking hands and kissing babies, aren't you? <laughs> well, for me, it's, it's, it stopped being about me a while ago. I think when you experience losing someone, especially someone like a mother, mm -hmm. you realize, Time is fleeting, you know, and I saw I saw that I've experienced the real power of music. It's no longer I'm tr it's no longer about trying to write a song to make it do something for me to get famous. It's not about that anymore for me. It's it's experiencing love and connection and healing through music. So if I'm going to write a song, it's going to be, you know, with my best friends, it's going to be intentional with a purpose. You know, I have a couple songs out there, you know, that came from that place. And you know, that's, you know, that's for me, that's the whole reason why I'm on the show. It's just the, for the power of music to hopefully, you know, make the world a better place with my voice and with my songs. So that's really the grind. There's a lot behind the scenes that people don't know. We're not just sitting around like uh, it is a grind. Uh, it is Nashville is a really hard place to live when you're not writing songs, mm -hmm. you're networking when you're not networking, you're, you know, promoting a show that's booked or trying to book a show. And then when you're not doing that, you're on the road and you're traveling and you're performing and leaving it all out on the line. Um, literally every weekend of your life. So, <laughs> it is a, it's not for the faint of heart, you know, but there's no plan B for me. It's, I'm not, it's not what I'm trying to do. It's really who I am and what God has designed me to do. So, I, I, I gotta ask you, I, I, I was blessed with the opportunity to talk to a lot of musicians during that lockdown, and a lot of those musicians were really upset, which is the reason why I created a, a show on iHeart called Play It Forward, because I really believe that musicians needed to be heard. What did you go mm. through knowing that? That stage was not there. You're a creative. You can't just turn this stuff off, dude. It was not in lockdown mode. Right. Yeah, so I'm engaged to Kylie Morgan. She's a country artist signed at EMI here in Nashville. She literally told her mom when she was 12 years old, I'm going to skip college. I'm going to move to Nashville. <laughs> We're getting married this, uh, this year, actually, in a couple weeks. Um, so, you know, her and I... You know, we've the reason why we work is because we never turn off music. We mm -hmm. literally will be the one who will wake up in the middle of the night with a song idea and write it together. So during the pandemic, you know, and not only, you know, it showed our true colors about our relationship. And that's when I realized she was going to be my wife because yep. um, we did spend so much time together. But it also forced us to sit down and, you know uh share our heart through music you know so we wrote songs every day kylie's kylie and i both released songs that we wrote in the pandemic and then you know i i learned that you can you know the power of technology you know i'm so thankful for computers and iphones and zooms you know i didn't stop playing shows i just did it a different way yeah. so remember i did i did a show for the national alzheimer's association for aarp there's oh. thousands of on the zoom you know and i was just thankful for the opportunity for actually be in one place for a while with Kylie, my, you know, soon to be bride. And uh, still because of technology, like we're doing right now, we're able to still stay connected. So nothing really changed for me. I just didn't get to do the handshaking <laughs> so, and all the hugs. I'm a very affectionate person. So I definitely miss that connection with people. All right. I've, I've been a wedding DJ for 29 years. So I've got to ask you with your wedding coming up, what have you, what have you chosen for your first dance? So Kylie and I actually, uh, we decided we don't want to be cheesy and like sing all of our own songs right. for every dance. So we actually have a friend uh, that was on the show, Songland, uh, Sam DeRosa. She's uh, in LA and she's going to sing a song, an unreleased song that Kylie and I wrote together to call We Do. So it's going to be really, really special to us. She's going to play the keyboard and sing to us. So I'm pumped. And then also for, uh, this is a long story, I'll condense it. But so obviously I lost my mom, so I don't get to do the, the mother son dance. Um, I said I'm going to split it up between Kylie's mom, which has yep. really filled the, filled a big role for me. And then also the reason why we're getting married in Fort Myers Beach, which is another story, the hurricane. We were supposed to get married October 1st, but the hurricane Ian came mm -hmm. through and Devin, Fort Myers Beach wiped out our wedding venue. But the lady that owns our wedding venue down there, she actually, um, I met her because we got invited to Island Hopper Fest down Fort Myers Beach years back, became friends. So when my mom passed away, this lady literally said, I've always wanted a son. I can never be your mom, but if you know, if you're up for it, I'll play the role of mom and you can be my son. We literally treat each other like that. She calls me almost every day. And so that's why we're getting married there is because it's basically like having family there. So I'm going to split up my, my uh, mother-son dance with Kylie's mom, Rhonda, and then 
this lady Mary Torgerson. So it's going to be really, really special. You do realize your wedding day is also a renewal day for the people that are coming there. And the, I had a preacher tell me one time, he goes, he says, when I share this message, I'm actually reaching the back row. Those are the people that wanted to sit back there because they didn't want to be seen. I mean, I, I just, I mean, for uh, as a new husband and wife, you realize you're changing people's lives, right? Man, I, I, I really hope so. Um, you know, I can't help but be proud of Kylie and I for, you know, uh, we live, we're in a very tough industry. You know, there's a lot of heartbreak. I mm -hmm. think there's probably more heartbreak than there is positive. Uh, so we've learned to really cling on to each other. And uh, for me, it's just relationships are everything, but she's my closest relationship. And I think if we can paint a picture of love and loyalty to others, I think we've done our job as a couple. So, Do you find yourself studying Blake and Gwen? I mean, my God, it's right there in front of you. Yeah, man, it's it like, I, you know, to be, you know, almost a husband and then to be in front of a guy that's, you know, a country music icon who's doing the same thing with his wife, but on like a celebrity status level was, was pretty cool. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. Yeah, look, you know, just to see how he looks at her and how, you know, she looks at him, you can tell they're honestly, truly in love, which is awesome. You know, you know what's so great about Blake, though, and I'm so jealous that you get to work with him, is that, yes, he is an icon, but he doesn't act like it. He acts like a guy that lives next door. Yeah, he really is. I mean, he's just like, I think it's just, he'll say it to you, just like, I've been doing this, you know, successfully for 20 years, <laughs> you know, and he's the dude wearing a flannel, which I think is what makes him relatable. You know, so I'm learning. I've learned a lot from him, just how he holds himself as a man, and how he's not trying to project anything or puff up his chest mm -hmm. to anyone or shoes. He's just being himself, which I think there's so much power in that, and that's how people relate to him so well. So learning a lot from that guy. You, you and I are both here in the South. Do you think that's just his Southernism coming out? Because I mean, that, that's one thing about the South. I mean, you know, you you can try to act tall. Someone's going to knock you down. That's right. <laughs> yeah, I've been in, you know, I grew up in a small town, Iowa. I left when I was very, very young, though, and I lived in Savannah, Georgia for a few oh, years. Yeah. Ago. Going on 10 now here in Nashville. So the culture down here really is that just, you know, and the music industry has done that to me as well. Just like if you think you're something that you're not, the music industry is going to teach you real quick. So <laughs> yeah, I, I found it's always best to realize that you're not the shoot and that someone out there is better and bigger than you and there's a lot to learn. And so I always, you know, I try to wake up every day and remind myself that. And that's why I'm covered in tattoos, man. They're all stories. You know, every, every, every one is a story. I, you know, I look in the mirror, I'm not, you know, like I need to be reminded every day what God brought me through to make me who I am. So he keeps me. Oh, my God. Sure. That, that's so interesting you say that because, you know, I, I've got long hair to, to the middle of my back and people, you know, they'll judge me because of that long hair. I go, you haven't seen my tattoos, man. Let me let me go ahead and take my pants down here so I can show you. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. I love it, man. That's awesome. Rock and roll. All right. We got to get serious about you singing Leather and Lace. My God, dude, this is a huge song in my life. I know exactly where I was, when it was happening, when I when it was first played on KOOK out of Billings, Montana. When you wow. guys started singing this song, I was like, oh. <gasps> And then, and then all of a sudden, I had to take a second breath, and I went, "Shoot, man, they they got it right. They got it right." Well, man, I was I was hoping so. You know, it's it's always tricky when you sing a song that's a classic. You know, another uh, iconic song. You know, and so my dad was my mother could not go to sleep at night without the clock radio blaring country yep. radio. I yep. don't think dad slept the wings. So, uh, you know, but my dad is a hippie, so he's yeah. got you know. <laughs> More tattoos than me. He had long hair growing up. Uh, I remember being 10 years old, my first concert, fist bumping to Mr. Roboto. So he, he raised me He raised me on on the legends of rock and roll, man. I, li I listened to his entire, you know, his vinyl collection. And so big fan of the Eagles. So to be able to, you know, try to pull off a Don Henley song and Stevie Nicks song was pretty important for me. You know, I think it was cool for my dad to see that too, to, you know, and try to make it also it's just like, you want to respect the song, but you also want to make it your own. So I'm really proud of Kara and I. I think we pulled it off and did it justice. Wow. To hear your passion, I hope on your journey that you also get the opportunity to meet every one of these people you're talking about because I've been with the members of Styx and, and, and all these classic rockers. And the special part about it was it, I, I thought seeing them live was brilliant. But when you get to hear them share their passion as a real person, holy crap, Jay, come on. Yeah, I'm all ears. Like I said, I'm, I'm soaking that in. I've got to meet some really, really cool people and artists and open up for a lot of on the countryside, at least. Mm -hmm. So 
And yeah, I, I, I'd love to meet <laughs> Dix. That'd be awesome. Now, 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 you know what Leather and Lace is all about, right? I mean, you talk about taking, I mean, Stevie Nicks writing this song with Don Henley. I mean, th- this is about Jesse Coulter as well as Way- Waylon Jennings. I mean, she took a page from the past and made it the present. And then you guys continue the story on NBC's The Voice. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I actually, you know, I couldn't help but think about Kylie and I's story and what we've been through, you know, while we were kind of, you know, understanding this song and what it meant and, you know, how, she, you know, Stevie wrote it about another couple and then her and Don Henley being together. And I think every love story is unique and special. And just to be able to kind of share that heart and bring it back to life was really, you know, special to me. So what what is the name of your first dance one more time? And, and, and I'll explain it here in a second. The reason why I want to know. First dance? Yeah, your first dance. What's it going to be again? It's a song that Kylie and I wrote called We Do. And the reason why I say that, remember, I'm a wedding DJ. I want to make sure that that yeah. becomes every, you know, a piece of everybody's future forward. Oh, man, I love that. We'll definitely have to release it. <laughs> you're going you're gonna to have to because, I mean, look, look at Bruno Mars. I mean, even even look at the group Train with what they've done with, with wedding songs and stuff like that. They, they become a part of the music soundtrack. So that's why you got to record it. Dude, you got to record yeah. it. Yeah, we got lots of plans for releasing, you know, new music after this journey. And, you know, I'm excited to share, uh, you know, like I said, I've, my main cause and focus has been, you know, to bring light to, you know, the disease Alzheimer's that yep. took my mother. But I've been writing in Nashville for 10 years. I, I've written 2,000 songs. I'm not lying. I'm not exaggerating that number. I've been grinding and writing. So I'm excited to finally share those works of art, songs that are really special to me. I hope they connect with well, people, you know, I, make them fall in love all over again, make them feel uh, some sort of healing, excited, <laughs> all these things. Well, I challenge you to get in touch with the people at Mont Blanc because they, they take Alzheimer's very personal. And to hold a writing instrument that was designed after your songwriting, dude, I, I, I would be blessed to have that writing instrument as part of my Mont Blanc co- collection. Oh, that'd be awesome, man. Let's make it happen. Well, let's make it happen because, I mean, all uh, they, they really do embrace Alzheimer's at Mont Blanc, and it's just one of those things that, you know, writers have got to come forward with their journeys so we can change lives together. That's right. Yes, sir. Excellent. Man, Jay, you got to come back to this show anytime in the future. The door is always, always going to be open for you. I would love that, Errol. Thank you, man. What a pleasure talking to you today. Well, you be brilliant today, okay? <laughs> back at you, sir. Thank you.